Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and joining me today is Michael Gora, who wrote a wonderful book we're going to talk about today called The Saddest Words. Michael, thanks for being with us today. My pleasure. So uh, now uh, here's the book. This is William Faulkner and uh, about his Civil War. And uh, Michael, how did how did you get interested in Faulkner in the first place? Well, in some ways, it's because I was told I was going to have to teach him. Um, you know that that one summer, uh, the summer after I got out of college, I I was a teaching assistant for one of those summer enrichment programs at a New England prep school, and and uh, they said, okay, one of the books we're going to have these kids read. It was like an AP course. Is as I lay dying, and you're going to be in charge of that one. Uh, you know, I'd I'd read late in August when I was a freshman on my own. I was blown away by the first 10 pages and then utterly confused by the rest of it. Yeah. Um, you know, I I hadn't seen those kinds of jumps in time or anything like that before. By the time I got I got to as I lay dying, I was, you know, I was I'd been through an English major, I'd read Ulysses, I'd read Virginia Woolf, I was on my way to graduate school. Um, it still confused me for the first. 15, 20 pages until I figured out the, the the basic wrinkle that the the name at the top of each chapter was the name of the first person narrator for that chapter. Uh, some of the names were still strange. I mean, Darl, I'd never heard the name Darl. I didn't know it was a, a corruption of Daryl, you know, phonetically spelled uh, Daryl. Uh, so I, I, I read that novel three times over that summer and, um, and taught it to my 16 year olds. Uh, but I found that at at this place at this school there were a lot of other people in my position, summer teaching assistants, um, who had read Faulkner before. Um, you know, they'd had they'd had different undergraduate experience. They'd read The Sound of the Fury and A Rose for Emily, and what they were telling me about it made it sound really interesting. So I started poking around. I spent much of that summer when I wasn't in class um, reading other Faulkner. Uh, and by the end of the summer, I thought, okay, there's this book, Absalom, Absalom. Uh, and, uh, I think I better read that. And so, uh, when I got back to my, my parents' house in Connecticut, um, you know, packing up, I'm ready to go out to the West coast for graduate school. I read Absalom, Absalom, and I felt as if the top of my head had been taken off, uh, <laughs> you know, that, 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 you know, I'd never read anything like that and ever read anything that was at that sustained pitch of fury um for a long time a book that made me made me think and troubled me and disturbed me so i i read that um and then i put faulkner away i kept on reading him on and off when but i i was concentrating on 20th century british literature in graduate school when i got to my my teaching job at, at smith college I did have to teach a course called just fiction for first year students. And it was, you know, how to read a novel. Uh, and I always put a Faulkner novel on there along with Dickens and Austin and, you know, whatever else I felt like that term often now because Panin. Um, so I put as I lay dying on there a couple of times. I put the sound of the fury on when I got, when I got a little tired of the same class sessions, not tired of the novel, but tired of my own class notes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so almost every year I taught a Faulkner novel, but I never, I never wrote about him, uh, didn't think about writing about him. And then, um, oh God, I was three books into my career, um, two on British and post-colonial fiction, and then a travel book about Germany. Uh, I was at the MLA, the annual convention for English professors and started talking to one of the editors for Norton Critical Editions. And, you know, we kicked around some things I might do. I wanted to write, to do an edition of a Conrad novel. Okay. And she said, no, uh, we don't think there's a market for that. Uh, now, of course, they do have an edition of that particular novel. It's The Secret Agent, but yeah. done by somebody else. And a couple of days later, I got an email from her saying, we, we don't have your, your CV on file, but send it down to me just in case. So I sent her the CV. This is a long story, but you know, uh, it's a good, it's a good one. Uh, I, I, I sent her the CV and she wrote back, I think later that day and said, would you be interested in doing 
an edition of As I Lay Dying for the Norton Critical Editions. Because we 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 have the Sound of the Fury, we're going to expand. We've got the rights now to As I Lay Dying, and I wrote back to her and said, you know, there is nothing at all on my CV that says I know anything about Faulkner, anything about that book. But in fact, I've taught it ten times. Okay. So I did the edition. Um, as part of that, I went down to Oxford, Mississippi toward Faulkner's house, drove around the the real life county on which he based Yakna Patofa County, uh, talked to some people, and went back to the conference, the annual conference they have at the University of Mississippi the next summer. Um, and ideas started to percolate. Mm -hmm. uh, they started to percolate. And and uh, I was at that point, I was writing a book on Henry James. And when I got done with that, I thought, okay, I want to write a really American book now. I want to write a book that focuses on American literature. James was sort of my my halfway house toward that. <laughs> um, but uh, but I thought I thought I'll, I'll write about I'll write about Faulkner and and uh, and at the same time I was also getting much more interested in in the history and the literature of the Civil War. This was when the New York Times was doing its series on a. On um, it was 150 years after the war had started, and they were doing something like a Civil War day by day with different people doing blog posts. Right, they're um, disunion series, right? They're disunion series. So I I, I was reading those um, uh, as they came out almost day by day in in 2010 and 11, and got interested enough to start reading more. The Library of America at that point also did the first volume in in its. Uh, collection of civil war documents that is called the civil war day by day mm -hmm. um and i read those as they came out and gradually a book proposal took took shape and took form okay oh wow so lots to unpack there um lots to unpack yeah no yeah, yeah. It's, it's, well, a, it's, it's a long it's story fun. but <laughs> it's very faulknerian in its language yes right? yes yeah, yeah. So, um it's interesting you, and it's you mentioned digressions it. <laughs> well, actually, I've, I've followed you pretty well there. So uh, okay. uh, people make that sort of criticism when they read Faulkner, how he kind of weaves all over mm -hmm. the place. But I always find like he always brings you back where you need to come. He does. He does. And that and and the the side roads he takes you down, which do come back, are always interesting. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So you'd mentioned the Norton Critical Editions, and uh, mm -hmm. that's how I first discovered Faulkner with the, okay. the Sound of the Fury. And right. so, you know, great, you know, I was a wide-eyed grad student at the University of Maine, and I read this, mm -hmm. and, and I sort of feel like I had the same reaction you had when you read Absalon, Absalon. I felt right. like the top of my head had been blown off. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Just crazy. Yeah. Um, as we think about kind of Faulkner as an American author, as, as a, you know, a figure that, you know, pretty much everybody's heard of, but maybe mm -hmm. few people have read. What's right. a good way for people to get into him, you think? Well, I think um, he's hard. He is hard, and there there's a steep entry price. It's full-blown modernist fiction. But the other thing that makes him hard is that the novels all most of them intersect with each other you know the story that he begins in one novel will be picked up in another novel um or the characters um you meet in one novel will have a backstory that you don't know because it's expressed in in two or three books before that or that maybe he hasn't written yet he hasn't written the backstory yet uh he does that quite a bit people complained about this with the first of the Akhna Patofa novels so, um what he called flags in the dust, though, when it was published, it was published as Sartorus. Uh, that is that he had about five or six novels going on in there, as a friend of his said. And it seemed very confusing to the first readers because those different stories were predicated on things that were already present in his head, but that he hadn't yet written. You read it now after reading a bunch of other Faulkner, it seems all perfectly clear. Uh -huh. um, but, but... So there, there's that that steepness of the entry point. Um, I do tell my my people that the way to start is, in fact, with As I Lay Down. Okay. Uh, it's just hard enough with all those different 15 person, uh, 15 different first person narrators. But it's not really predicated on knowing any other Faulkner. Um, it's about a family that 
that doesn't reappear in his other books, The Bundrance. Some of the minor characters, most of the minor characters do reappear, but The Bundrance don't. Their story isn't contingent on anybody else's story. Uh, and they make a journey from the deep countryside into the, the county seat of Jefferson. Um, it's actually the, the novel in which Faulkner first named the county. He'd already given the town a name, but he hadn't named the county in, in any of the, the two earlier Yoke and Patofa books. Uh, so that's the first time the name appears. Um, so it's, it's a book that, yeah, that slowly takes you into that world. Um, so I, that, that, that's where I tell people to begin. I think they can also then read some of the short stories, mm -hmm. um, uh, Barn Burning, um, which is an introduction to the world of the, the Snopeses, uh, who figure more and more in his later work, um, A Rose for Emily, which is a strange, um, you know, that's the original tale of Southern Gothic, um, uh, That Evening Sun. Um, in which the Compson uh, family appears, but um, it's short. Um, it's about their relations with uh, a black woman who lives near their property, who is afraid that her husband is going to murder her. Um, uh, so, I so some of the some of the short stories are also good places to begin. And then you know, yes, the sound of the fury, hmm. and uh, I do think that anybody who reads the sound of the fury should have a kind of little one or two page primer uh, on how it's going to go uh, that so that you know going in that you're in the mind of uh, that it's three different first person narratives uh, each from the point of view of, of uh, one of the Compson brothers uh, followed by a third person narrative um, that there are four Compson children the brothers get their first person narratives the sister doesn't and yet everything the brothers say revolves around their memory of the sister yeah you need to know that the first of those narrators uh benji is an intellectually disabled man who can't tell the difference between past and present so he's always flipping back and forth between them in his mind that uh some external stimuli like like his sister's name caddy for candace he hears a golf somebody on a golf course shout caddy and that name sends him back into the past. He catches his shirt on a nail going underneath the fence, and that sends him back into the past. Um, so, so once you know that, um, you can begin to piece together the narrative. The next, the next brother Quentin, we meet him on a day when, as a freshman at Harvard, he's planning on committing suicide at the end of the day. We follow him around. He too can he can tell the difference between past and present, but sometimes sometimes he loses the present and falls back into the past. The brother Jason, the third brother, who is nominally sane but bitter and spiteful, and it's viciously viciously funny his narrative. Um, and then a fourth narrative uh, that focuses again on the. The black people who have um, worked for the Compsons for generations. Um, the novel set mostly in 1928, um, and it ends on Easter Sunday in 1928. You you need a little primer, but then it starts to seem starts to seem uh, coherent. We get a picture of this family over time, uh, of the decline of the family. Once you once you've read The Sound of the Fury, you can read anything. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's you, you can read anything. You can go on to the other Faulkner novels. Um, the book that I love more and more with time is Light in August, the first one I read. Okay. Um, and what I love about it is it's the most comprehensive portrait of that town, uh, looking at that town of Jefferson from the point of, from many different points of view. Um, and uh, so it's it, yeah, it's 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 a portrait of of a, a community that well, I can't say it holds together, but that it 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 we 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 get a dozen different angles on this uh, on this community with different people telling stories, uh, different uh, points of entry into the town. That I think is one of the things also things I also like about that is is we we 
we don't get the different first person narrators as such that we do in light as we do in as i lay dying in the sound of the fury what we get is a third person narrative that will pause while somebody tells another person a story right and so you start to get in that novel a sort of wonderful sense of of a still living oral tradition that is represented on the printed page uh somebody telling another person about what they saw um and i that that's one of the things i, I love about faulkner the way he captures the speaking voice or the speaking voices because they're all different of the people in his world and, and there are tales within tales and tales and within tales, tales. And tales within the ta yeah tales, uh, that, and it, and it, the, the novel ends with a kind of almost like an extended dirty joke a traveling salesman story <laughs> um uh and you know it's 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 a very it's a capacious large book yeah i think it's a very emblematic of uh, faulkner's overall kind of approach where he basically said i i can know this one postage stamp and i can know it really well yes um, yes and by exploring that that sort of gets to the larger human condition and so that, that will get the world yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and and so you know that novel where, where we have all those different approaches to to jefferson and the county and stuff and that's that's kind of his whole canon is really just exploring mm -hmm. and exploring and exploring right. what's going on but not just in space but also in time in time in time i think i think with you know in faulkner the two are always um i don't want to say they're always confused but they're always intersecting, you know, that that you you can't move in space without also moving in time. Uh, you can move in time without moving in space. Uh, but I mean, I'm not moving in space, really, as I sit here, but we, we, we've we gone on for a few minutes now. But he has a way of saying that space becomes time and time becomes space as, as if they're interchangeable. There's there's that the wonderful example of this is again in his i lay dying where where two characters where the, the one of the narrator of that chapter darl is standing on one side of a river in flood and his some of members of his family have managed to get across the river uh they've walked across on a sunken bridge but the question is how to get a wagon across it uh the bridge won't take it and he looks at them standing on the other side of the river and he thinks as if it's as if the space between us were time uh, that they inhabit because they inhabit a different space. They inhabit a different time as well. Um, and, and yeah, they're, they're always, they're always falling into one another. And, and I, I think that's in part because Faulkner has a sense. This is what, this is what everybody says about him. What he said about himself is the past isn't past. The past isn't past. It's it's not over. The past is continued. It's not it's not only continuous with the present. The past is the present. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and to to understand him, to understand, I think he says, has a sense to understand his region. You have to understand the way that that the past is present. Um, it's never over. And I think that that probably brings us to our discussion of the Civil War. I would think that, so, yes. You know, like the, the war is still with all of these mm -hmm. people in all right. sorts of different right. ways, but they all tend to be sad and tragic ways. Yes, yes, yes. You know, that, that you know, that, I mean, I think we've seen in many ways now that the the Civil War is more present to us now than it might have seemed 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and not just because there's so many good historians writing about it, um, but uh, that that's some of its issues uh, about states' rights, about the relations between one race and another, those those are the pressing issues of of, of our time. Uh, the relation of of people to some kind of central authority uh, is a central is is a dominant issue of our time so it, it's it's present for all of us but i think i think for faulkner for people in the time he's writing in 1920s and 30s america it, it of course felt very present in the south uh that was the region where the war had been fought it was that was the losing those states felt they had lost the war the white people in those states 
stuff and they lost the war. Um, they could see its damage around them, sometimes in the form of, of, of ruined houses, sometimes in the fact that, that towns were all uh, made up of post-Civil War buildings, mm -hmm. um, that the antebellum buildings hadn't survived, or you might find the odd building from pre-war period um, around filled in with, with, with new things. Um, and then the fact that the South's economy had been had been ruined, um, you know that that's that is that sl this that slave based cotton economy uh, that had produced so much individual wealth for white planters uh, was not there. Uh, people still making a lot of money off of cotton, yeah. um, but um, but but that economy had been had you know fallen for many, many years and had been reborn to some degree in the upper south through through uh, textile mills, uh, industrial wealth as opposed to the agricultural wealth that had uh, that had had been dominant in in in, in the pre-war period. Um, so they felt the war as a very present thing. Um, you know, C. Van Woodward in one of his classic essays says that the what separates the South, and I think Faulkner felt this, was that it was the one part of the United States that had known a losing war. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we got to qualify that, uh, losing war for the white people there. I think Native Americans would say <laughs> they had known many losing wars, um, fought on American soil, and we see the results of of, of those uh, now in a way that I think people were not so willing to recognize when Faulkner was writing. Mm. Um, but, um, but that was, that, that was part of the, the regional consciousness, um, again, among, among, among white Southerners. That was, that was, that was the consciousness of the time. You know, as Faulkner says, um, in Intruder in the Dust, he said there's a space in the mind of, every Southern boy, uh, and I forget if it's 12 or 14 years old, I think it's 12 years old, where it is still not yet two o'clock on a certain morning at Gettysburg. Yeah. Uh, you know, and he says, every Southern boy, I'm good. At, I amend that as said every Southern white boy, um, but um, still not yet. That is when something has not yet happened. Uh, and the thing that's not yet happened then is, is, is Pickett's charge on the third, third day at Gettysburg. Um, when you can imagine that the battle still hangs in the balance, that Lee's gamble in going into Pennsylvania might succeed. Um, and, you know, that, that there's, so there's this constant recurrence to a past that you know has happened, but to the moment before it did. Mm -hmm. um, that that you know has happened, but that you can imagine it as otherwise. And you know, then F Faulkner's working in that 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 time when um, you know, the lost cause mythology takes shape in probably starting especially in the later 1870s and 1880s, but it's still going strong when when, when he's a boy. Um, he writes about, he says in some of his interviews about seeing Confederate veterans uh, with empty sleeves uh, hanging around the, 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 the town square in Oxford. Um, he hears stories growing up. Um, it's very, very present to him in a way that it's not to a boy of the same age growing up in New England mm -hmm. um, who would have different stories to tell about the American past right, right. Um, and and so so that 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 shapes his consciousness um, and there are also all those memorials going up um, you know the great age for putting up Confederate memorials is uh, well there are two great ages quote unquote great great uh, I've got to put scare quotes around that word. Sure. Uh, but from about 1890 to 1910, 
and then again post Brown v. Board in '54, going on into the mid '60s. Right. Uh, those are the periods when when those memorials go up, uh, and his grandparents are involved in putting up memorial on the Oxford Town Square, um, and you know that so that, that that makes it conscious to him as well. And in New England, where I'm from, where I guess you're from, there 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 might be a a little plinth on a town green. Um, it's not so often a statue. It's usually like a low pedestal thing with names on it. Um, in one of the towns near me, it's it's the names on the steps of the town library, um, but but not not the full blown monument that you find in every town, every county seat throughout the South. I guess the difference is in in Boston and Cambridge, um, they're everywhere, uh, and some of them are some of them are really magnificent. Um, Memorial Hall at Harvard and the, the memorial to the Massachusetts 54th in, in Boston. Those are magnificent memorials, but they are atypical for the North, I think. It's it, it kind of interesting when you talk about that. And, and uh, you know, I think about like a Daniel Webster who's who remembered, you know, veterans from him from his days growing up. But they're right. like the glorious patriots of the revolution. So like there's right. this sense of inspiration and victory Whereas right. Faulkner's growing up around those same sorts of, of veterans, but they were on the losing side. And there's that loss yeah. and that melancholy, and that really infuses mm -hmm. kind of his whole perception of, of uh, the on the losing side, but still felt by by people in his world to be glorious. Yeah. Uh, whereas I think I think I think in New England, uh, in other parts of of the North, um, there there was not that there was not that sense there was a sense of victory. Mm -hmm. Uh, but not that sense that uh, that that veterans have any kind of special claim. I guess maybe Ohio, which producing so many veterans who were presidents in yeah. in the, uh, the the last third of the nineteenth century, would, would would be an exception to that. Um, but but no, there there's not that sense of that the. That the future, that the, or that the present is determined by that immediate past, and I think because the present is determined by the robber barons, the present is determined by by the, yeah, by the growth of industrial capital, and then by by things out west, mm. um, and and the south sort of stays as this this uh, I'm making a little shape that <laughs> sort of corresponds. Uh, is is this this isolated part where whereas the you know the energy the the, the thought in the north turns said well we're going to get that railroad out to california and we're going we're going we're going to exploit that and we're going to we're going to build steamships and and things like that and and that's where that's where the future lies uh and so that your sense of the past is you look towards the past that made that particular future possible uh, and, and it's no wonder reconstruction fails you know it's a hot mess but we right. get the shiny new thing out west like of course exactly we attention to exactly that. right right yeah yeah and that that's one of heather cox richardson's arguments in 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 the books that that she was writing before she before she became a, a daily blogger um you know that that the people turned to the west mm. um and that that that's where federal energy and federal money and federal power went, uh, rather than ensuring ensuring uh, the success of Reconstruction. One of the things I think is so successful about your book is you start with that Southern boy thinking about that moment mm -hmm. that hasn't yet happened, right. which is probably how most Civil War people know Faulkner is through that quote and that right. sense right. of possibility. Um, how? Uh, tell me about your decision to kind of start there and, and how that opens your book and, and kind of takes yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Well. You know, I, I I balanced that that moment with with another moment from um, from flags in the dust, mm -hmm. where uh, um, he's now an old man. He's in in nineteen twenty is taught, but who was the son of a Confederate colonel is talking to his father's last surviving trooper, and the man tells a story of you know some adventure. Um, and it is a kind of just an adventure, uh, with no political consequences or, or bearing. 
and uh you know as as it's told and then the the old man asks the older man um he says tell me tell me one thing more just what were you all fighting about and the trooper says damned if i ever did know you know that that is he can't understand that, that he's got no conception of what the war was about um you know it it is it's war it's adventure it's loss but any sense of root causes uh he's got no real sense of that um and what i do is ask well well how did how did that happen how did you know because when the war started people knew very well what it was about right um you know it's it's in mississippi's uh statement of secession uh that this war is designed this is designed to preserve our system which is founded on slavery mm -hmm. um you know that, that they're very clear that that's what what secession what this is about and over time that belief gets occluded it gets half forgotten it gets lost in the rhetoric of reconciliation between the different parts of the country um you know so 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 clarity vanishes in the time between the war itself and the time that Faulkner's writing about it um and so that that was interesting to me um you know how how did that happen how did people at the time understand what was happening how does all this register in his fiction and i think i think he's i think he's he's actually very good on the the occlusion of memory mm -hmm. um the way in which people forget or in which they selectively remember um and then i started asking you know well, what about the the presence of the war in his work you know people people his earlier critics and historians thought that the war didn't show up very much in his work insofar as he he very rarely wrote about it directly he wrote about it in a directly in a collection of stories called the unvanquished which the originals of them had run in the saturday evening post mostly as sort of mass market popular fiction um and he was drawing on a lot of the conventions and stereotypes of of lost cause fiction in that though i think at the end of the book he sort of goes back on them a bit um because the end of the book is also about the costs in violence that that attitude has brought to the people the, to, to the people who 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 uh have held that that the the main character is not the the, the father of the the young boy who narrates it is shot down in the street by by a business partner and he's earlier founded the local kkk and you 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 see the costs to that society of 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 the attitudes that that father embodies that famous confederate colonel um he didn't write about it directly very much but it's there all the time yeah. he writes a lot about the pre-civil war settlement of of that county in both um go down moses and in absalom absalom and then in a strange late book that is basically uh, laying out the history and mythology of a town called called requiem for a nun um he writes about the aftermath of the war um not just a little bit in the unvanquished but in in sort of the way in which you can see the effects of the war in the growth of the sharecropping system, in the ways in which the certain parts of his county are now where there had once been a plantation, been great plantations. It is now virtually, it's all small farms and virtually all white because the black people have been driven off. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it, it's really, it, it's, it's, everywhere but you have to know how to read the absences yeah. um and and that was that was a pleasure to do 
uh, of pleasures, it was it was a, a challenge as well. Uh, but but to 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 read the absences and see the war in those absences. Um, one of the things I found as I was as I was working on him is is that you know in addition to be um, to being an, an astonishing novelist, a great technical innovator, an extraordinary creator of character, and somebody who can master every tone. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he can be deeply disturbing, but he can also be very very funny. And sometimes it changes from page to page. But in addition to that, um, he really is, a, I think, an extraordinary historian. Um, you know, I mean, he read deeply about the war. Um, but I think he's got an understanding of the war that was in advance of where professional historians of his time were. Um, that... that um, yeah, that that you know that 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 professional historians of his time were were in the were in the reconciliation, were in the the idea that the plantation system was basically all right, that you know, that black people were happy under that system. Faulkner knows that's not true, um, and you know, in many ways, in many ways, his <clears throat> his understanding of the war and of the society that produced the war is is a lot closer to that of W.E.B. Du Bois mm. uh, than it is to many of his of his white peers in the South. Uh, you know, late, and late in life, Du Bois challenged Faulkner to a debate on, on um, desegregation, and Faulkner refused, and he he sort of backed out of it. It's not one of his best moments, he said. He said, you know, we don't really disagree on fundamentals. We disagree on timing, but timing was fundamental. <laughs> uh, timing was fundamental, and no, nobody nobody imagines that Faulkner would have come out best in that debate. I mean, Du, du Bois Du Bois had spent a lot more time arguing in public than Faulkner did. It he 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 would have won that one. Um, but um, but in the nineteen thirties, um, you know, Faulkner's understanding of of how the war went and of the way in which the war put uh, long columns of black people marching on the roads towards freedom or towards what they towards what they knew not. Right. Uh, and he writes about that in The Unvanquished. That's a lot closer to Du Bois's black reconstruction in America than most professional historians of the time uh, outside of Du Bois. Uh, we're going to recognize. I think one of the brilliances of his work is that uh, it probably offers the best way of or best lens for understanding the antebellum South and the post-war South, mm, yeah. even though, he, like you say, he's not explicit about it, but it's almost like a fish doesn't know it's in water because exactly. you know Southerners yeah. are just immersed in this, this experience. And so it's right. just part of how they go through life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I think that's right. I think that's right. And then the, the war itself is sort of this, this black hole at the center yeah. of his work. Yeah. Uh, we go around it we before and after, and then in between is this kind of maelstrom. Uh, I think that's how he, he describes it in one of his books, this maelstrom into which we don't really go and really don't want to go. Yeah. Um, it's, so. uh, and, and I think that, um, you know, for all the bravado and for all the bluster that Southerners might have had, I also think he's really good at like saying, but if we're really being honest with ourselves, you know, there's yeah. this sadness, there's this melancholy, yeah. there's this, why do I hate the South? You know, um, right, right. You never say that part out loud. No, exactly. Exactly. Uh, there's a moment in, 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 in direct Requiem for a Nun where he's providing his history of, of that imaginary county and he says that what happens in 1861 is they they go over a precipice that they think is an apotheosis and and i i, I think that, that that's how he how he ultimately saw it yeah yeah so i think also um and he does a really good job of sort of 
reflecting on the memory and, and remembering the memory, but then reflecting on the memory of the memory or ref- yes. like, like there's a meta level to it. And I think right. your book is just a wonderful way to kind of extend that even further. You do a really good job of reflecting on the memory. Oh, and thank you. Reflecting on the reflection. And um, so it, it, to me, it made your book just such a fascinating, wonderful read because it really peels back all these layers of the onion. But it can also be hard to keep your arms wrapped around that. Um, yes. Tell me a little bit about how that works for you. Well, um, a lot of it is honestly intuitive. Okay. Um, uh, that one, I made a, I made a, I think a, a crucial decision early on, which is that I was going to try to, I was going to treat his whole body of work as if it were a single novel in which I could move at will mm-hmm. back and forth, back and forth. Um, and then I was going to try to work my way through uh, through the history. I'm going to treat also treat Yokna Patafa as if it's a real place. And I'm going to work my way through its history uh, from the pre-war period on up to the present, or on up to the moment which Faulkner's writing in the in in the 1920s and 30s. One of the things that meant was that weirdly, I I end the book with the uh, the novel that for many people kicks it off, kicks Faulkner off, which is the Sound of the Fury. Uh, you know, so so I, I work my way up to the sound and the fury uh, in in the next to last chapter, uh, and then there's a chapter to wrap things up. Um, uh, you know, that's yeah, that that's for a lot of people where it begins, mm-hmm. uh, but because it's set in 1928, uh, you know, it's it's also at sort of the end point. Um, you know, and there there are things you can do with books set later, but uh, and and I you know I. I regret that I don't have more to say about as I lay dying and light in August, which are said, you know, a couple years after that. Um, but, but so I, I work up towards that present um, while moving around within, within the, the huge body of his work and, you know, plucking a moment from one novel and matching it up with a moment in another novel uh, in order to produce that, that, that historical portrait. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there are some sort of tricks or problems I had to deal with as I was going along. You know, the, you got to get a certain amount. Of, I want needed to get a certain amount of biography and you know how he came to the point at which he was writing certain of these books. Um, and so, so the, so I'm I'm going backwards and forwards quite a bit in in his life and in time, uh, but that's Faulknerian too. <laughs> um, and I think of I think of it as uh, you know the book is moving sort of crab wise, yeah. uh, toward toward towards that point. So, but, but I I do want to point out you know you mentioned how you treat all of his his works as a single novel, but I think you're extremely successful in not requiring a reader to know that body of work. Um, you're well, pretty good about giving readers the information they need. Th- and- thank you, thank you. I, I think um, honestly that. That's a skill I've learned from reviewing a lot of books over the years. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I write a lot. I've done this since I was in graduate school. I I, write, I review new novels. Um, you know, I write about new fiction. And one of the things you, you learn uh, in writing those is how to provide a concise plot summary. Uh, not just a summary for me, but a commentary. Uh, but that tells people where they are. And what they need to know in order to in order to follow, and you know, with the review, it's what you need to know to decide whether you want whether this is a book you want to buy, uh, or whether you want to spend your time and money with this. Um, time being more important, but 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 so that's that's a sort of yeah, giving the reader enough to know where they are in a given text, so so that so that you can then go forward. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think, I don't think honestly, I could have written a book like this or like my, uh, like my Henry James book, uh, portrait of a novel without having spent a lot of time, uh, writing in newspapers, yeah. um, and, and, uh, trying to convey 
the flavor of a given book and also what's happening in it um, uh, to a non-specialist reader. Um, uh, that that that's crucial for for the kind of books I'm writing now. Yeah, I think another key element, and this maybe sort of serves as a counterpoint to the high intellectual plane that the book is sometimes on, is you literally walk the ground, you know, and so yeah. it, you're very grounded in the book as well. Yeah. What was it like to walk in Faulkner's footsteps as you helped piece this well, story? Yeah, so so this is, you know, I mentioned earlier that I I, I wrote a travel book about Germany. Um, and one of the things I learned uh, in doing that is, is if you're describing, you know, you're walking around, um, anything you're thinking can become part of the story. <laughs> uh, and that it is also a good way to, to talk about books, you know, that, that to walk over the, the imaginary ground, um, you know, if the novel set in a particular place to go there. Mm -hmm. um and then you see the difference between between the one of the things that allows you to do is to see the difference between the real place and the place that's imagined mm -hmm. um so it lets you see what's fictional about the fiction um but you know you can use you can use the the scene of the writing where it was done or the scenes that are imagined in in the in the book um <clears throat> So in, in writing about Henry James, I got to go to Italy quite often, which was which was fun. Uh, here, um, I walked the battlefields. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I walked around Oxford. I visited his house. I sat having drinks on the square. Um, uh, but I walked the battlefields. I walked over the battlefield of Gettysburg, following as much as you can on foot the course of Pickett's Charge. Um, uh, you're you're in, down in in Fredericksburg, and I I spent some time behind those walls at Fredericksburg, um, uh, and uh, you know in other parts of the of the Virginia campaign, I walked over the ground at Shiloh, um, and which I think is the in many ways the most evocative, in part because it's the most beautiful stretch of ground. Yeah. Um, so so that allowed me to. I mean, most most battles are not legible. If you read about them, they're not legible. You, you can't understand the course. But when you when you, you see the ground and see how the ground was was configured, you can begin to understand how that flowed. Um, and you know, with Faulkner, also some of the houses um, in some of the surviving houses in Mississippi, uh, the driving through through those country roads, mm -hmm. um, you know that that. It's in, in a lot of ways the book is about place, and to do that you need you need to go to the places. Right. You know you can you can. I, I'll confess I use um, my Google Maps function and Google Earth to refresh my memory, but you need to go to the places. Yeah, uh, and that that I think is also one of the things that. Um, some people have told me that reading this book is like reading a novel. Um, and, you know, and that's, that made me happy. But one of the things that, 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 that created that possibility was, was my own movement through space, uh, visiting these places, because that gives you a story on which you can hang the kind of literary analysis, uh, that, that I do of the novels, you know, that, that you, you know, I, I wanted the book to tell a story because that's, stories are more readable than arguments right right so right and uh, particularly challenging since yaktapanoff is not a real place and yet yeah it is so real you know right. it right. is yeah. but it isn't right yeah. yeah yeah i mean i mean and and you know maybe it is but it isn't and may, maybe this is a good place to end but but one of the things that always strikes me uh when i when i go down to to oxford is that you know there are a few things that are very present there and you know the, the Faulkner is a presence. Um, his statues on the town square. You can see the courthouse he wrote about. Um, you can see. You can visit his house. But of course, the house is now owned by the University of Mississippi, mm -hmm. um, and that campus is right on the edge of the of the, the center of town with his football stadium. Uh, and that's what he didn't put into 
Yakna Patafa County. Uh, his, his town of Jefferson does not have a university there. He mentions the University of Mississippi. It's about 50 miles away from where he's writing, where he says that this is set. You know, and so so he he wanted his town to be a typical Mississippi County seat. Uh, the presence of the university makes it atypical. But at the same time, I, I you know, even though Faulkner was not a good or a dutiful student, um, I do think the presence of the university is in many ways decisive uh, for his work. It gave him access to books that he might not have had access otherwise, um, eventually to some people to talk to. Um, it, it, it's, it's a determining thing in a way that cannot really be defined, but I think, I think without, without that university there, we may not have had those books, uh, even though he, he would have hated the idea that, <laughs> that his, his work, his work is somehow, is somehow dependent on this, you know, being basically next door to the state university. Yeah, yeah. So and at the time they up... would have, at the time they would have hated it too. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Uh, so as we ramp up, anything I haven't asked you about that I should have? No, Any final I, thought you want to offer? I think I think that you're, this is good, but thank you so much for for having me. This has been a real pleasure. Oh, really? So the book is The Saddest Words, the William Faulkner's Civil War by Michael Gora. Uh, what a treat to chat with you today. Thanks so much for being thank with you, us. Thank you, Chris. So I'm Chris Mikowski for the Emerging Civil War Podcast. We'll see you online and on the battlefield.